Hi everyone, welcome to the first of a series of very special interviews. I'm Dr. Seha Mughal and I'm driven by a deep desire to help myself and others be the best that we can all be. As I learn more about the world of self-development, I'd like to share my learnings with you all and hopefully further the cause of an incredible, incredible, incredible organization that I strongly believe in. With that said then, it's a true privilege and honor to introduce you to the CEO of this incredible organization and the man that many, many years ago helped me realize the value of education and personal development. He's a man I've had the pleasure of learning some of the truest wisdoms from recently. His work with deprived children and adults continues to help thousands in remote rural parts of the world. Hailing originally from Wales, John Hunt joined the Colonial Police after leaving school and took a placement in Northern Rhodesia and then joined the British Army. After a number of years to provide a more stable life for his family, he landed a job at Marks and Spencers as a general manager, bringing in record sales to many of the branches around the UK. His final appointment at m and was at the Belfast store during 1988 to 1993, at the height of all the troubles, which he navigated his staff safely through. John has never shied away from a challenge. John worked on secondment with the Scientific Exploration Society, helping to run the charity and take out expeditions. In 1995, he arranged a youth community venture to take 26 form students from Northern Ireland to the highest village in the world, Kibbe, in Himachal Pradesh in Northern India. These students were sponsored by British Airways and on their return, BA offered sponsorship for John to take inner city students from London, Birmingham, Manchester, Newcastle, Glasgow, and other areas of Northern, Northern Ireland to carry out similar projects around the world. And ladies and gentlemen, Fulcrum Challenge was born. It was through the Fulcrum Challenge that I had the good fortune to join John on one of his projects, prior to which I received leadership training with him. We then went out into Gujarat and the Ran of Kutch in India to help build a school and orphanage. At the age of 17, it was a life-changing experience for me to say the least. John was always passionate about helping young people to prepare themselves for their future working life. He feels that the school environment isn't always able to provide the necessary experiences to do this. Instead, by developing leadership and team working skills through fundraising and working together on community village projects, students were able to learn experientially and so develop into potential leaders and team players for the future. With the help of a colleague and the staff in a barn in Milton Abbas, John organized five to six Fulcrum Challenge trips a year to India, Africa, Malaysia, Mongolia, China, Argentina, Paraguay, Patagonia. He took with him children from deprived inner cities and all other walks of life. Whilst overseas, the students trekked to remote areas of impoverished regions to carry out a village community project. Here, they interacted with children from different cultures, learned to appreciate real hardships, and always came back with a different perspective on life. Parents and teachers noted a huge difference in behavior in the students on their return, returning as young adults with improved confidence and insight. John's work with Fulcrum Challenge earned him the Jack Peaches Award for Outstanding Service to Young People in 2005, the BT Childline Award for Services to Young People in 2006, and the Special Recognition for Contribution to Equality Award in 2019. Using all of his experience working with children, um, deprived children and students, and in the charity sector, John set up the Lotus Flower Trust in 2008. Since then, the Trust has been building homes, schools and skill centres for children in remote, rural and environmentally challenging areas of India and has helped more than 10,000 children and their families. With just one part-time employee, John does all the work that is required to run a charity himself as a full-time unpaid volunteer. With the help of generous sponsors, a dedicated team of trustees, and after a lot of hard work fundraising from his, what he calls, shoffice in the garden, LFT has completed 60, almost 60 projects in Uttragand, Assam, Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, Rajasthan, and Ladakh. Amongst Lotus Flower Trust's key projects include the groundbreaking JSR Home and Skills Centre for Children with Special Needs, the first of its kind in Uttragand and one that we'll be talking about a little bit later on. The Trust has also built the Brahmaputra Home for Railway Children, 
many schools and kindergartens, a skill centre for women, a nunnery and an English language school in Ladakh, all of which enormously improve the education and employment opportunities for thousands of children and women who would otherwise be locked in the cycle of poverty. The Trust is now funding and building artificial glaciers in remote Himalayan villages to provide life-giving water where natural glaciers have receded far away from the villagers. John is now turning 80 in a few weeks and prior to COVID continued to take groups of individuals on life-changing trips. He inspires and helps so many with his dedication and enthusiasm. Although now almost 80, having suffered with COVID himself earlier this year following a heart attack, he is still going strong. He's young at heart, looks half his age, and ladies and gentlemen, still really has far, far too much to give to the world to ever retire. So as I said, it's a great privilege and a great honor to have John with me today, who has been a great source of inspiration for me in my life to talk about the pursuit of fulfillment and some of his current projects at Lotus Flower Tr Trust. Hi, John, how are you? Um, okay, thank you after all that. <laughs> long, long introduction. Mm -hmm. So you're turning 80 this year. How do you feel about that? Um, well, I wish I wasn't 80. The, the, the challenge when you're 80 is, uh, what do they say? Um, uh, aging is not for cowards. So <laughs> one, one spends one's life when you get to this age sort of trying to repair the bits that keep falling off. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you've got to keep going. I, I don't believe, I've never believed in retirement. I believe there's far much to do, more to do that we can contribute to the, to the country and to children and uh, deprived adults. Um, and so I just keep going. I have no intention of retiring. I'll retire from this desk when I drop dead. Well, I mean, you have led an incredible um, life uh, from, you know, everything that I've learned about you. Um, what, when I was with you uh, in, in India or when I was about 17 and also recently in conversations with you. Um, and so I'm really excited to share a little bit more about that. Uh, but, you know, so today the topic of our conversation is the pursuit of fulfillment. And so I know you're never scared to ruffle any feathers. Uh, so let's start with that. So tell me, uh, John, what's a go-go? Oh, a go-go. Oh, <laughs> golf, gardening and waiting for God. <laughs> well, that's my view of retirement. I, I, it worries me that, you know, older people are criticised so much that, we, you know, that people leave an impression that we live off the state. And I think to counteract that, we have to in, we have to involve ourselves in the community and the communities about about one. And uh, there's no way I'm going to sit and just do my. I mean, I've got a garden to look after. I don't play golf. Um, I watch my rugby, but uh, um, all Welshmen do. Um, but uh, I think our job, as if we get older, is to continue to co contribute to society. I'm lucky. I'm fit and well. I, mean, I had a bit of a problem this year, but, you know, we've got over that. <clears throat> so I've been able to get out to the wildernesses and to help people who really need to help themselves. And I encourage a lot more people to do likewise. Uh, when we have finished our so-called earning life, um, then we should start to put back. I believe we have to contribute. Yeah, well, no, that's incredible. Um, and so I think um, I'll go straight into it. So. John, over the course of the last few weeks, I've been asking you to send me stories of some of your extraordinary experiences. And I've literally, I've loved reading them um, and I've looked forward to them. And uh, you wrote me a story titled, How, How Did This All Start? And I, I immediately was uh, blown away by this profound quote, uh, literally in the first paragraph. And it read, space in a crowded world and stillness in a ceaseless flow. Uh, I mean, I had to take a few moments to really take that in. Uh, so tell me, how did this incredible journey of 30 years in the charity sector start? And what does this quote mean to you? Well, it all started really when I was in working for Marks and Spencer in Belfast. Um, there were a series of incidents that allowed me, um, supported by the board of m &S, to take a holiday with the famous explorer John Blashford Snell, Colonel John Blashford Snell. And we did, the, I think it was whitewater rafting descent of the Babai River. 
I've never done that before in my life, but it was most fantastic fun. And we ended up sitting on a Himalayan mountainside at the top. Behind me, there were 360, there were 180 degrees of Himalayan mountains and below me in the forest, um, Badia forest of Nepal, <clears throat> were tigers and wild elephants. Um, and there were Gangetic dolphins in the Kanali River. And I was sitting there with four other Johns and three other Johns. And one of them said to me, why, how much longer are you going to keep working for Marks and Spencer? Um, and uh, because you seem to be very well suited to this sort of life. Mm. And I thought for a moment and I said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do is I'll pack up when I'm 55. Um, I'll stop selling ladies knickers, which I've been doing for 25 years. Um, and I will um, come and work for you, Colonel John Blashford Snell. And, and John returned to me and said, well, there isn't a job. So I said, well, don't worry. When we get the opportunity, I'll write a job description for you and then I'll come. And uh, unfortunately, through the kind services of a gentleman called Sir David Seath, um, whose father was Lord Seath of Brimpton, who I was privileged to work for in Reading store. I ran his store in Reading for seven and a half years, which was a challenge, but great fun. I thought he was a wonderful man. Um, he said, uh, would I like to go earlier than 55? And in fact, the company was making some changes in their management construction, the way they ran their stores. And they said, um, would I like to go at the age of 52? Or, or go and work in one of the other big stores in the UK, or Belfast was a, had been the eighth biggest store in the company. Yeah. Um, and I thought, do I really want to do that? And so I made my mind up on the spot that I'd leave. I'd leave, I wrote, contacted John Blashford Snell, we wrote a job description. And I clearly remember standing on the, on the, on the, the far, the back end of the boat leaving Belfast, looking back over Belfast, thinking to myself, what on earth have I done now? Because really I had no plans. I was 50, 52 years of age yeah. and I had no plans. I know what I was going to do. I didn't know what my wife thought, what the family thought or anything. Mm -hmm. So it was all a big adventure, which is what I'm up for. I'm an adventurer. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm not like a, um, one of these men who go out and find the, you know, climb the highest mountain and all the rest of it. I don't mind climbing a mountain now, as long as at the end of it, there is a village where there's a project for me to work on. Yeah. Um, but I had no idea what I was going to do. And, uh, but I knew I was going to work for John for, for, um, for a couple of years. Wow. That's how that's, I started. That's incredible. <clears throat> um, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, that's an incredible story and uh, just in itself and you know following uh, what's been happening with covid and obviously um the economic situation in the world at the moment as well there's lots of young people that have been made redundant or are in the middle of a career change um so obviously you've navigated from being uh, having a senior position in uh, a big company like marks and spencers then kind of re-navigating into the charitable organization. So I think you're very familiar with what a career change and the transition looks like. Um, what advice would you give to those particularly young people that are in the middle of a career change at the moment? Go for it. Just <laughs> go for it. Because in my life, as, as far as I can see, in, in the end, up to the age of 18, you have your parents and your teachers and everybody telling you what you should do. Um, and uh, really and honestly, in the end, life is down to you, what you make of it. I always remember um, uh, sitting in a village called Rumbuk in Ladakh. Um, we'd been trekking um, over the mountains and one young lady came to talk to me. Mm. And she, I, she, I asked her, where's your future? Where are you, what's going to do? Have you had a good time? Oh, it's all over now. And I said, what do you mean it's all over now? It's, your life is starting now. You're just 18, you're going to university, etc. What are you going to do in university? And she said, well, I'm going to do geography and mathematics. And I said, oh, good. Do you want to do geography and mathematics? Are you good at it? And she said, yes, I am, but I don't want to do it. I said, so why are you going to do it? She said, because my teachers have told me to do it. Mm. So I said, well, um, aren't you going to live your own life? Are you ex going to live everybody else's life and not just your own? Yeah. I said, uh, what do you really enjoy? And she was a young lady from Newcastle. Okay. And uh, she said, I really enjoy going out in the wilderness and trekking and going on the mountains or potholing and coming home 
on a Sunday night, having been out in the field, going to the local pub, throwing my pack in the corner and drinking a pint of beer. That's what I really enjoy. And I said, so you've just seen Miss Grumpy and Miss Happy. Isn't this the route you should be taking? And she went off to, I don't know, Bangor or Anglesey Univ uh, or Aberystwyth University doing outdoor, some outdoor management course. And as far as I know, because I've not heard from her for years, um, that's what she's doing, which is a total change. And so I, my, my view is, you know, you do what you do. If you get up in the morning and look in a the mirror, there in front of you is the person who is going to affect your life. If you, you know, you can talk to that person and, and discuss these issues. And if you don't like what is uh, you're doing, then change it because nobody else will do it for you. Change it. Yeah. Change Absolutely. it. I think that's great advice. Um, thank you. OK, um, so I think you've already touched on some of this, um, but I've become a bit notorious for asking this question amongst my friends. Um, and it's often perceived as an annoying question, actually. <laughs> so the question I always ask is, why? So whenever anyone tells me something, um, the first thing they say is, well, why? Uh, but why? But why? But why? And so really my question, my next question is kind of, uh, why do you do what you do? Oh, goodness me. Because I love it. <laughs> yeah. Simple as that. Just I love it. I wouldn't. I, I've been, I'm, I reckon I've got the best job. In the world, really. I mean, with the exception of fundraising, which I absolutely hate. If you could see my desk now, my desk is covered in 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 pages of stuff where I'm trying to fundraise, and it, it is so frustrating because they say for every hundred letters you write, you get one reply. Well, yes, for every letters you write, hundred letters you write, you do get one reply, and that reply says no, and that's even more frustrating with a two one liner or a two liner. You spend hours filling in some in application form, which I hate them. I absolutely hate them, but they've got to be done. Yeah. If I didn't do it, and if it wasn't for some very loyal trustees and, and, and friends who helped me from their companies, um, have, have helped me from their companies, then you know we, 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 we can't exist. We, we have to go through the motions. And in the end, everything that we do, or I do as the chief executive, I mean, I've been at it for 30 years, and I've virtually never, ta I've never taken a salary in, in uh, Lotus Flower Trust. I don't, don't earn any money from Lotus Flower. I think for a couple of years in Fulcrum Challenge I did, but basically I won't take money that's destined for children or people who who don't have the facilities of love life I have. I have a one, I have a lovely home. I was very lucky with my pension from MS. So I live on my MS pension now. Um, we were a flying company when I was uh, working working for them. They were a fantastic company. So I do it because it's what I enjoy. Um, there's nothing, you know, that's the, there is, I'll tell you what, there's nothing better, Sheer, than, than um, seeing the fruits of one's work. So when you've actually raised some money, you've invested in the project and you see the, the smiles and happiness on the people's faces when you deliver their, their particular school or home or... I had a really wonderful experience on Saturday, on Friday. I had a message from... We, I, we made an arrangement with a company called Motivation India to provide 30 wheelchairs yeah. to Pagir. It's called People's Action Group for Inclusion and Rights. I had a, um, have you got time for this story? Is it all right for me yes, to tell the story? Absolutely. Okay. Please, yeah, okay. yeah. Well, a couple, a few years ago, maybe, maybe seven years ago, was it five years ago? Yeah. I can't remember those sort of details nowadays. Um, I was in Ladakh, yeah. which is my, it really is my second home. Um, it's called, used to be called Lip, Little Tibet or Place of High Passes. And I went to see the education minister who is, a, she won't mind me saying, she was a small lady, typical Tibetan lady. Um, and uh, she said, oh my goodness, John, I'm so pleased to see you. And I said, oh my goodness, why, why, why what, what, do you, what do you want from me? And she said, well, I've just, I'm education uh, um, minister, but I've just been given the job of looking after special needs people in Ladakh. And I never worked with them. And I didn't even know that you had to provide a wheelchair for a purse for children to get into school in wheelchairs. And I need, would you be prepared to write me a five year program on how to run um, the special needs uh, program for the future? And I said, no, no, I can't do that. But I can try and raise money and build you a center. 
And I was introduced to a man called Iqbal who ran um, PAGIA, People's Action Group for Inclusion and Rights. And he was working out of, in a remote area in one small building with one room. Mm -hmm. And through the services of uh, um, various people, we, we, we funders, we provided them with a proper center. Um, we provided them with uh, uh, facilities where they, we, they were given a, um, a recycling machine by the local government. And so we provided a, a warehouse in which to put the, the recycling machine. They then provided a huge building to collect the detritus from Ley, the capital city, where they convert all this stuff into paper and sell as books and uh, writing books and pay newspaper and whatever. Uh, so then next thing was with great help from the boys from Winchester College, who I worked with for some 10 years. Um, they come out with me, they go on a trek on the mountains, but they come and work on a project. They for two, over two years, raising something like 60,000 pounds, we built a center for the people, um, when I say accommodation, a hostel. So they have now a hostel for 36 people. Somebody's just given me some money to provide toilet proper toilets and uh, washing facilities for special needs people attached to the to the to the uh, hostel um, but I asked them a few about a couple of years ago um, do anybody in Ladakh require wheelchairs so it was a stupid question to ask and I got an application for 30. Okay. Now Ladakh stretches from one end of the Indus to the other end of the Indus and one end of it is Pakistan and the other end is is uh, is uh, Tibet uh, Shiba China, if you have to say it, but the China Tibet. And uh, they said, yes, we want 30. So we want 27 for individuals, and we want three spare ones to go into collapsible that we could use for traveling. So I worked with a company called Motivation India. We, it cost us about £8,000, which is nothing really when you think about it. And on Friday, I received pictures from Pagia of a lorry loaded with 36 huge parcels of uh, wheelchairs that had come all the way from Bangalore, which is 2000 and approximately 2015 miles over across nine states of India and ending uh, coming up from Srinagar and then across a pass called Jazila Pass, which is a huge horseshoe pass, which is very dangerous all that way up to 13,500 feet in lay. And that was, you know, that was a vindication of chasing the money and all the rest of it. And I now know 30 people, 27 people, who in no way could have received a wheelchair. There's no way that, particularly these are specially built ones, yeah. uh, would have ever received a wheelchair like that. So, we, you know, that's the satisfaction of, of what, what I do, just to know that that's going to happen. Yeah. That's an incredible, uh, that's incredible. Um, and it would be great to actually, if you have any pictures, um, to, sh to sort of share those as well. Yeah, we'll, yeah, yeah, yeah we'll, no problem. Um, so I guess, I guess that kind of leads me to uh, ask you a little bit more, and obviously you've, you've given me some insight here as to where Lotus Flower is at, at the moment, um, but just tell me a little bit more sort of how this year has been um, what's going on at the moment with Lotus Flower Trust and what's the, what's kind of the next few months or the next year looking like? I mean, there's no doubt we're in a fight. Mm. Um, I mean, they all want me to retire. I mean, let's face it, I'm 80. They all think the old fool is going to fall off his perch any minute. So why don't, you know, why doesn't he retire then? We can all relax. And well, say, I'm not going to do that. Not really. Um, we'll stop running the charity when I can't do it, you know, do it. Um, but I'm going to keep going. But it's in a fight, and the fight is one thing, and that's money. It, it, charities work with money. You yeah. can't get away with it. People talk about all the wonderful work we do and all the rest of it, but in the end, yeah, yeah, fine. We can't do it without without getting money. Yeah. So my main job at the moment uh, over this COVID period and, and over the whole year, except when I, I go to India for maybe um, two or three weeks, maybe three or four times a year, yeah. And then I go to remote areas. Uh, I take my trustees with me or I don't go on my own. I love going on my own. Um, and um, I, I, 
I'm not able to do that. Maybe hopefully with the, if I have a pill, I'm glad I'm 80, I get an injection. If I just have an injection, then I can go anywhere, can't I? Um, so that's what I hope to do, but we're gonna to have to have the money. I mean, I, the can't, we live on the cash flow. My cash flow tells me I'll go bust in August next year. That's yeah. not really good, is it? But I mean, you know, I've got to keep on top of it. Thank God, it is very inexpensive to run my office. Yeah. This is my home. So I don't charge loads of like, trust any money for, for running this place. Yeah. I have to pay my dear associate beside me, Laura. Um, and I'll be a pay, pay a bookkeeper. And, and then we have to pay for insurance and that, uh, insurances. Um, and we have to pay for paper, but we recycle paper. Um, we, we use both sides of all paper we use if we're printing off the machine. Somebody's given us a, a nice printing machine here. So it's it, that's the situation at the moment. As far as um, how is it going, the fundraising? Well, I just have to tell you that in the last couple of weeks have been fantastic. There's a company called the JAC Trust. Mm -hmm. I'd never heard of, but I just picked them up by accident off something I was reading. And I wrote to the JAC Trust. They had a very good um, application form, simple application form yeah. to fill in. Then I did a second application form. Then I had to do an hour's interview with this lady. Um, and we ended up getting £22,800 from them, um, of which we will take to run the office, maybe, uh, I think, probably about 10% um, to run this place. Um, and the rest of the money is going to provide artificial glaciers for two remote villages, um, Lamayuru mm -hmm. and Zomal village. Yeah. Um, in the in the high Himalayas, similar to the one at Ursi, which we've already built. So those are signed on, they've just been signed on. And then come again, completely as a big surprise to us, uh, Delhi Duty Free, which of course is an Indian company and it's the only Indian company um, we, uh, we, we're, we, we've been able to, to work with them. That's purely because of contacts of my trustees. I mean, I, an example is I wrote to 61 Indian businesses in the UK the other yeah. day, another single reply. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, that's what I expected. I didn't get a single reply. Anyway, maybe, uh, maybe, the, maybe there's one in the mail. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, hopefully. But Delhi Duty Free have been working with us for quite a while, particularly on Janice Roberts' uh, home for special needs children. Uh, they've been wonderful sponsors. And the chicken shed school where we built a, <laughs> we built a school, which originally was a chicken shed. Um, so they funded those projects. Yeah. And they picked up four projects in Ladakh for us. So that happened the week before last. Yeah. So, you know, that's really good news. But, but then now we're going to the sort of next period, I suppose, um, where it will be moribund for, for quite a while and very, very quiet. And, you know, so the fight is on all yeah. the time. Yeah. Well, tell me about those four projects in Ladakh. Like, what, what are they going to consist of? Okay, right. The first one is um, they're going to fund um, one, uh, they're going to fund me one uh, artificial glacier. Yeah. Not me, they're not funding me, they're funding the Lotus Flower Trust. Please don't think it's all about me because it's not. It's about my trustees, it's about the funds. About, it's more to more to me than makes than is, is actually well, my physical. When you being. say me, you mean your cause. I understand. They are my cause. Yeah, they are your our cause. So then, then uh, we talk about the the uh, one artificial glacier they're yeah. going to fund, um, and they're going to fund a which is called Yulchung, which is a wonderful name Yulchung. It's, it's right up on the edge of uh, of um, Zanskar, where mm -hmm. Tibet touches Zanskar. That's fantastic. That would be an adventure getting up there. Yeah, no. um, <laughs> then they, then they're gonna then we're gonna yeah. Um, I've got to walk up there somehow. Yeah. Um, then uh, my, my, all, my, all our friends in Ladakh who work for us, because we have a group of people who, who support us in, in India, actually. Yeah. Um, then uh, we're going to, they're going to build a, an Anganwadi. Now, Anganwadi means kindergarten. And about um, well, 10 years ago, I was challenged by the then director of education of the, it's the it's ICDS, the Indian Children's Development Society. 
they said, John, would you do something for us? I said, oh, why, we're fine, yeah, okay, anything, what would you like? Will you build us 30 Anganwadi, 30 kindergartens in remote areas? Yeah. So at a cost to us of about 11,000 pound a year, probably cost 9,000 pounds to build, actually build. So this is because the ladies in the remote areas of Ladakh, they put their babies on their back, in on their backs, and then they go off to work in the fields with the yaks mowing and all the rest of it. They don't see education as a priority. Yeah. But the opportunities for children now in India are fantastic. It is such an amazing growing up. I mean, they're having a very tough time at the moment, but they are unbelievable. And the people in Ladakh, and particularly from these road area, remote areas, can get left behind. Yeah. So we've got to encourage them to go to school. So the Anganwadis are built in um, primary school, uh, uh, close to the primary schools. And uh, we've built, I think, 17 of 30. So I've still got 13 to go. Yeah. Um, so that extra one is going to help. Yeah. Uh, we don't, I'm not sure where it is at the moment, but. Um, I'm sure it'll, it, the boys will come back and tell me from the DAC Riggs in who works for me is fantastic. Um, so then the other two projects, so it's four projects. The other two are in Pagia itself. One it is they picked up the bill for 14,200 pounds, I think, for, I don't know, maybe 12,000 12, pounds to build the toilets and washing facilities for the hostel yeah. in Pagia. And then also they're building, uh, the fund is, uh, means we can build build a two-room um, hostel for people who go to Pagir to teach um, the special needs people um, skills or whatever it is is required. So it's a very, very generous donation. Thank God. Thanks to, thanks to God. Well, I'm glad that's come through for you, actually, and for Lotus Flower Trust. Yeah. Um, so, and I know that there's so many wonderful projects, uh, almost 60 actually, uh, weird Lotus Flower Trust that we could probably talk about. Um, and I'm sure many, many of them have been huge successes. Um, I wanted to talk to you about one that maybe you feel has not quite been successful and just kind of riff off of that, why, why, why it's not been so successful or, what went wrong or was it were you able to turn it around um well there's one uh, project that uh, um really bugs me I, yeah. and uh, i'm I, I cross because i lost a very good potential funder entirely because of a misunderstanding really but but really this the worst situation i, I, I went to a place called guwahati in assam and I'm, I think you're going to ask me some questions about the Brahmaputra home in a minute. So I'll just put Brahmaputra home aside. But on one particular day, somebody said to me, oh, we want to show you something, John. And I always, when anybody says that to me, my, my flashing lights, red lights come up in my mind. And we went to the garbage dump, mm. the garbage dump of Guwahati. Yeah. And I, we stopped about say 100, 100, 200 yards away from it. Mm. And I couldn't work out why this garbage dump was moving. I was looking at it and it was moving. And I thought, I don't know how on earth is that? And then, I, then eventually as I got closer, I mean, the smell was just unbelievable. Um, but as I got closer, I saw there were all these birds from that uh, um, were on top, going through the detritus, digging through the detritus. They were, um, What's that they called? Uh, I don't know, it doesn't matter. But I mean, there were, there were, there were hundreds of birds, hundreds, and cows. Yeah. And they were all rifling through this enormous, enormous pile. And then as I got closer and closer, then the next shot came right in the middle of all this, there were these children. And they were working on the garbage tump, sifting through the, the, the detritus. There were about 30 children, they told me there was more than that, but there was about 30 children um, I saw. Pretty, oh, fantastic, the little girls. I mean, they were unbelievable in the middle of all this terrible mess. And uh, I swore that um, they had no education. No, nobody was had, nobody knew how to achieve it. And I wanted to build them a school. Um, couldn't build a school close to the garbage dump. It had to be I think it was about a mile away because 
all the land was um, inspissated with this foul stuff and it was, you know, so you couldn't build close. Uh, but they, they needed education and they needed some sort of uh, washing facilities and they need, I mean, they were living there, their, their houses and their pet, they, they were part of the rag picker trade. I mean, if you want to go down the line and go to the, the lowest of the low, and then they talk about the caste system in India. I mean, one of the worst jobs I've seen is the job of a rag, rag picker. You go out at five o'clock in the morning and sift through the rags. Everything in, in India is recyclable, including you and me, really. We're all, everything's recyclable. But those poor people have such a dreadful job. I mean, it breaks my heart. And the same applied to these children. And I just could get nobody. There was a company who were prepared to fund it. Um, some lady had seen me working. I met her in an airport and asked me where I was going. I said, I'm going to the garbage dump. And she said, well, what are you doing there? And I thought I really got them on board. But unfortunately, I lost them because I couldn't get anybody in uh, Guwahati to back me and the government officials, nobody to run, run the thing. So I could build, if I could build it, I could, so I had the money to build it, but I couldn't get anybody to run it. So, I mean, it still bugs me every day. That, that one is a real worry. Yeah, so that, that would be seen as a failure. I, I'm, I see that as a failure. I didn't get there with that one, unfortunately. So, so tell me about um, Brahmaputra. Oh, Brahmaputra. Well, that was another one where we went to go. I had a, a, an email from Umesh Buru of uh, Step. Yeah. Um, and he said he'd heard about our work. And could I go and um, have a look at a potential project? So we jumped on the aeroplane and flew two and a half hours. Wonderful flight because you see on your left hand side, as you sit in your seat, you see the Himalayas, you could see Everest. And then below you, you saw the Brahmaputra River. I mean, it was a staggering flight. I love it. And then we go, went into Assam and landed in Guwahati. It's the biggest town in, in Assam. It's the confluence of the five states. It's over what you fly over what they call the chicken neck because there's a very thin bit of land where the, these uh, states, Nagaland is one of them, um, are, are adjacent to Assam, Meghalaya. And they, but they arrived there and they said, right, we want to show you something. So off we toddled along this road in the middle of, in the middle of Guwahati. And Guwahati is a, it's, it's a bit rough. It is a bit rough. Um, and uh, we, we turned up this road and in the middle of the town and lots of people there. And I saw oh, this railway running along here. And uh, I thought the, the post was across because there's obviously a train coming. And I thought we were going to wait and then go across and carry on. No, no, no. We walked up and we turned left straight onto the railway line. And we walked down the railway line and I couldn't believe it. There was these shanty shacks on either side of me as I walked down. And that there were children there and I could see that their mothers and the, the men were into rag picking. Um, well, the, the ground was, the, the, even where the railway was, were, was black. Um, there was a couple of really horrible toilets. There was an open hole, which was black, but in the hole, and people were washing in this hole. And the children came running, 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 and they were all over me. And they'd not seen, an, uh, who, I don't suppose, white Westerner. I, in fact, I know no Westerner had ever been down there before. And so I got to meet the ladies. There's always to meet the ladies and a couple of the men. And uh, they, as I said, they were rag pickers. And of course, they were also ladies of the night and had great fun because I took them all for, into a dab or into one of their little tiny restaurants and, and gave them, uh, bought for them chapatis and the curry and all the rest of it for them. And the, the chap who owned the place didn't want these women in his, in his, cafe, in his, his restaurant. And I, I barged in and said, forget about it. We're, we're going, we're going. And so we, <laughs> so we, I got this huge, food, all of them, great plates for all these ladies to eat. And then, so they all started to eat and then they stopped eating and started folding the chapatis and putting the curry somewhere and pan it all up and then putting it in their bags. So I said, well, why aren't you eating? No, no, we're taking it back to share with our families. So that was wonderful. So they said to me, as far as I could make out, the, the, the girls there, there were very few girls well, there were girls, but there were few girls over the age of 14. Why? Because they'd been trafficked 
into prostitution and taken away. And they've gone to Delhi and Mumbai and all these dreadful, I met, I met one girl that came back from one of these places. Horrific, absolutely. She was completely smashed, this girl. Um, and boys go into chain snatching and drugs. They're all on drugs. They're, they're all glue sniffing, you know, this, what's it called, dendrite. And they put it in, in, uh, paper, in paper or in a rag, uh, sheer, and then they sniff it. And it destroys their mouth and it, it destroys them. and they normally takes about eight years to kill them so it's horrible the whole thing is horrible so i thought right i'm going to build you a lot of home uh for the children um and this this woman said to me the lady came tugging at my head, you will do something for us and i said well i'll build you all a home thank you and you john john you do it now won't you you won't wait to do it i said no i'll, I'll build this home so we built it uh, but the funniest, it's really funny, really extraordinary. I was very excited about what I'd seen and what I thought we could do. And as I was walking away, Ashok's party, Ashok um, Trips, who works with me in India, he's, he's me in India, most wonderful man. Um, he said, what are you doing making the commitment like that? Because you haven't got any money, have you? And we haven't got any land. So we had no land and no money. Okay, so I went back to the hotel and I phoned my wife Anne and I have to tell you, I was so upset about it. I couldn't talk on the phone. Um, it, it, it emotionally upset me. Most of these projects do emotionally upset me. So I had to put the phone down, phone it back later when I calmed down. Anyway, and I said, well, I made this commitment. I got no money and I got no land and God knows if I'd be allowed to do it and all the rest of it. So that, that was that. The next morning, this is quite honest here, I got up the next morning, went down for my breakfast with my sort of head going, I, I can, I'm going to let these people down. And a girl came in, one of the step team, and said to me, um, oh, John, there's been a miracle. So I said, what do you mean there's been a miracle? She said, there's been a miracle. There, this is true. There is an old lady. And she is in um, hospital, in intensive care. And she is dying. And she has signed over to you a huge piece of land so you can build your home. Wow. She'd heard through another person and she has signed. I, she, I said, is that true? She said, yes, you've got your on the outskirts of, of uh, the town, on the outskirts of Guwahati. Um, this piece of land is now yours to build on. I said, well, for God's sake, get back to the hospital before she dies, get her thumbprint. Make sure we've got all the papers, so we've got this thing. So we had, so we have the land, and that, and 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 we built it. And there's some pictures you're going to show, I think, about of of all the children. The children are fabulous. Um, but there was another funny incident. I mean, they're full of funny incidents. You either cry or you laugh when you're with me. Um, that uh, it, we we did the foundation stone. So we were laying the foundation stone in in this land. And while we were doing this, they brought some of the, a load of the kids, the kids, uh, to watch, and uh, they'd put red. We, they'd bought, especially the the steps uh, people, had bought about twenty four. Um, it wasn't about. It was twenty four red plastic chairs, adult chairs, and they were sat in a half circle. By coincidence, I think it was about twenty four children came from the slum. But it was a slum, the railway slum. And they all ran, and guess what they did? They all went and sat on the chairs. So I said, well, why the hell are they all sitting on the chairs? This is a wonderful place, it was mountainside. Why aren't they running around the, the mountainside? Two things, John. Number one, they'd never sat on a proper chair before in their lives. I know, because I sat on a three-legged one when I was talking to the women. And um, secondly, they won't run around because if they run around on the railway lines, they get killed. So that was the lesson. And then where we were actually having the ceremony of this, the, the, the priest was doing the ceremony for the Bhumi Puja, um, which was Bhumi Puja. The, uh, um, there was an old lady in white running around, walking around the whole of the site. And I said, well, excuse me, but who is that old lady who's walking around the site? Oh, he said, that's the lady who used to own the land. She's been miraculous. There's been another miracle. She's recovered. She's been discharged from from uh, intensive care and she's very well and this was about 
eight years ago. She's still very well. Wow. <laughs> so anybody listening who wants to give me any thinking, you know, you'll live a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a beautiful place. And the, the, the funders have done such a great job in giving us money. And it's grown like Topsy. And we've now got this a home for um, 50 girls. We've, we, we can't put boys and girls together over the age of 11 anymore. So we, it started out as a boys and girls home. It's now purely girls. And it's a home for 50 girls. And it's, it's beautiful. Well, there are some boys there, but we don't tell anybody about that. But, so <laughs> there are a few boys there. <laughs> well, you've just shared it on, <laughs> on uh, this video. Just shared, yeah, yeah, publicly. Well, I'm sure nobody from the Indian government will listen to this. <laughs> Not unless they're from after me. <laughs> um oh that, that that honestly that story when uh you sent me that story actually it just absolutely blew me away and the pictures are absolutely stunning um i'm very moving uh so yeah i commend you um on, on that project and all we, the should, we should give you some pictures of the of the railway slump the railway itself because yeah. that's show stopping i mean i've not i've never forgot that one. you know you're famous when you arrive and park in the uh in the railway car park, which is situated about four or five hundred yards away from from where the slum starts at number three gate. It's called number three gate at number three gate slum. Yeah. And you walk towards the slum and all of a sudden you see all these children running, shouting, shouting your name. Yeah. That's very moving. Yeah. I'm sure you're looking forward to being uh, back out there. So yeah, I am. Yeah, and so if things go well and according to plan, when when do you think the next time you'll be out there will be? Um, about half an hour, if I can go. Um, where well, it depends on COVID yeah. and, and money, money yeah. and COVID. I mean, I have to, you know, it, I, we 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 don't stay in the poshest hotels or anything like that, as you you well know. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's got to be paid for, and uh, you know. But it's down to COVID, really. Uh, I mean, we can sort out our problems here in the UK, I hope. Yeah. But India is a different kettle of fish, you know. 1.3 billion people, they're not all going to get an injection, are they? Yeah. Um, so that's a worry. And I'm prepared to take a risk, but don't tell Anne. Don't tell my <laughs> wife. <laughs> if I can go, I should be on the first flight. But I can't, I can't, I can't go unless um, Madam agrees. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, um, you've been hugely fortunate in a way because uh, Anne, so your wife uh, of many, many years, has been incredibly supportive, isn't she? And, and you've had a lot of support from your family and your friends as well. Um, and sort of how has that fitted into you being a CEO of a charity and kind of doing all this traveling all the time? Um, I... I, the downside, well, poor Anne has had to suffer with me because when I came out of the army and joined MS, MS, you would move every two years from promotion. So I, I don't know, I, I, we moved, sold a house. I used to leave Anne selling the house while I was finding another one. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we started in, no, we didn't, we started in Sheffield where she qualified. She's a doctor like yourself where she qualified and then we went to Sheffield, Leicester, Huddersfield, Swansea, Portsmouth, Dover, Tunbridge Wells, Reading, Belfast. That was my career. So every time I came over 25 years. So the poor kids were suffered with their education. Well, they didn't. You see, they, they didn't. They did well with their education. And, and my, my eldest son is a consultant geriatrician in, in Worthing. Yeah. So um, we... Uh, they made the best of it. They weren't very chuffed occasionally when I came along and said, sorry, chaps, we're going turn to. So we had to find something. We had to find something that was a plus factor with everywhere we went. And funnily enough, I remember when I said we're going to Huddersfield and we were like, oh, my God, Huddersfield. We never heard. I didn't know anything about Huddersfield. But we went to Huddersfield and that was the best of fun. I loved Huddersfield. It was great fun. It was a great <laughs> place. But um, yeah, yeah, I could I could make fun out of being in a even in a retail store because we did have a lot of fun so it was you know down to them because you know you, you've got a unique committed family ar around you quite um, if you don't have that commitment i mean anna's done her times of going to india she doesn't want to go again she's given up now and <laughs> having had altitude sickness and all sorts of other things inflicted on her. but i took the kids there the year before last in, in, in august 
yeah. most of them came uh, three of two of my my eldest son and my daughter brought their families my youngest son couldn't come he was in america but they came and they were able to see what i did and go to ladakh and then go and visit the taj do the tourist yeah. tourist bits yeah. i don't do tourist bits normally but anyway if i have to go i have to go <laughs> Well, I think uh, I think it's safe to say that uh, you know you've lived a very blessed life, uh, and to be able to make a difference on, on the scale that you have um, is is to be in a hugely fortunate uh, kind of situation in your life, um, and and it's all the people around you that have probably also been able to help facilitate or support uh, you in doing that. Uh, so I commend you and and actually all of those people that have been a part of that journey as well. Um, so John, just on a closing kind of note, um, if there's really one thing that you'd like people to really um, take away from watching this today or listening to it, if they're listening to the uh, podcast, um, what would it be? Oh, I'll, I'll, can I read you a, a, a piece? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've given you one this morning, which I think you probably can use in the, in the, in, in the yeah. thing, but I'll give you a parable, okay? On. Oh, I love that. Of the starfish. Do you know this one? I don't. Okay. A little girl walks along a beach throwing fish back into the sea when she meets an old man. The man asks the girl why she is throwing the starfish into the ocean. She said, the sun is up and the tide is going out. If I don't throw them back, they will all die. And the old man said, but there's a whole beach full and it runs for miles. You possibly can't make, you possibly can't make a difference. And the little girl picked up a starfish and threw it back into the sea and said, it made a difference to that one. And that's what and that's what we have to do. Yeah. You know, if, if you help one child, you know, you, you're really blessed. Yeah. Well, um, can can always expect or even though expect unexpect um, you to say something or share something very profound. Um, so, yeah. So, John, thank you so much. This was absolutely incredible. Honestly, I was so excited uh, to do this. And um, I guess I'll finish with a Mr. John Hunt special, uh, your one of your favorite Chinese proverbs, uh, which is, and it's something that you shared with us uh, where, before we left for India, uh, the group that I joined for, uh, in Fulcrum Challenge. And um, the Chinese proverb goes, go to the people, live with them, learn from them, plan with them, start with what they know and build with what they have. So I hope you've uh, all watching this enjoyed thoroughly this conversation with John. Uh, if you'd like to find out more about Lotus Flower Trust uh, or support any of the projects, uh, follow the link below in the bio and do like, subscribe and comment below as well. We'd love to hear your thoughts uh, and your feedback on all of this. Uh, so this was John and Seher in conversation. Until next time, my friends, stay safe and stay inspired. Thank you.